When he went to it, I chided him. His armor didn't fit properly. Called him a silver clam. I never saw him again after that. Hey, my name is Joss Corvus and I'm here as ever to discuss all things story in this video, Rings of Power, Episode 7. Where to start? Let's start with the tone of this video. Many of the comments are going to be about bad writing or bad story. That's unavoidable. This was not a good episode. That is not to say I believe the authors of this show are bad writers. There are a lot of reasons good writers produce bad writing. I'll cover some of that in the end of season review. This breakdown is not about the writers. It's more a lament for all the bad decisions the writers made for whatever reasons they made them. There are so many bad decisions, in fact. We're only looking at the ones that wounded me the most. Importantly, from a commercial point of view, we're looking at the negative impact these decisions will have on audience engagement for future seasons. And by audience, I mean the vast number of the audience, your average family sat at home expecting to be entertained. The catastrophic failure for audience engagement is Adar's turning on of Mount Doom. Well, that's not entirely accurate. It's what happens immediately after. That's the problem. The Mount Doom event terraforms a whole region of Middle-earth. It turns a beautiful countryside setting into a desolate scorched wasteland. No more flesh and bone wildlife in the Southlands. It took down whole tracts of land, forests, villages, but it had barely any effect on a vast number of flesh and bone elves, humans and Numenorians caught directly in the blast. Should the writers have honoured the level of real-world attrition a pyroclastic event would have demanded? Of course not. This is fiction, and above all else, this is fantasy. But for the writers to then not inject any story element into explaining why so many survived is verging on criminal negligence. You have a fictional fantasy show, and you never bothered injecting a fictional or fantastical explanation for almost everyone surviving. The writers turned away from an opportunity to inject some creative element to draw in and enthrall the audience. They just did nothing. It wouldn't have taken much. Galadriel muttering some elvish like she did to a horse, or dropping to one knee and slamming a sword to the ground, a bit like Meteor Man did a couple of episodes ago, with his arm. This would create, in our imaginations, the sense she manifested some level of protection for the village. That's all it takes. Give our imaginations something to build on as part of our entertainment experience. But no, they did nothing. The writers wanted to turn on Mount Doom and terraform the Southlands into Mordor. They wanted the pyroclastic money shot, but then someone refused to come up with any means to inject any fiction or fantastical plausibility into surviving the event. Why is plausibility so important for the audience? Because the lack of plausibility breaks our trust in the physics of the world. If you don't explain surviving something so devastating, so unsurvivable, the audience won't believe anyone can die from this point onwards, no matter what happens. It removes all sense of stakes and peril, which is the essential threat of any conflict. Because there is no peril or stakes, there is nothing in the world now that might be considered a threat. We don't have any character development and now no sense of peril in the world. The show becomes moving pictures with sounds. Nothing the audience has any investment in because what are they going to invest in? Good examples are Isildur and Muriel, who both survived the blast, only then for Muriel to be blinded by a couple of hot ashes and Isidore crushed inside a collapsed burning building. Do we think Isidore is dead? Of course we don't. We care for Isidore because the show is placed in front and centre for the last three episodes. But the story world has removed any reliable ability the audience has to measure the stakes or peril. Who knows if a collapsing building is going to kill someone? So we stop caring beyond partial interest. Do we think Muriel will be blind any longer than the showrunners need her to be blind? For whatever purpose they made her blind? No. We know risk in the story is not determined by the world or a sharp sword 
or lava. It is defined by what the writers want to happen. And this is not something the show can even undo in the last episode, even if they land that episode like they haven't any other. So, the superheated cloud of lava and gases has raced through the land, destroying all in its path, apart from the flesh and bone in this village. Galadriel picks herself off the ground and walks off with Theo. Why? Because the, audience, because the writers needed a sleight of hand to distract the audience from the reality of what they just did. If they didn't have Galadriel head out of town, they'd have to show all these people picking themselves out of Ground Zero. And it's still laughable when we see this procession of barely scorched eyebrows later. Barely any scorched holes in any fabric. Beyond distraction, what is the story purpose of Galadriel and Theo circling around the village? We get some exposition the writers needed to get off their chests about Galadriel's husband? plucked out of thin air to serve some end that is not part of this story. Because it was dropped here, I'm sure we'll find out in the next episode. The writers then managed to checklist another homage to the original trilogy, which at this stage feels like overreaching, almost insulting, in fact, to the original trilogy. The writers will have some purpose giving Gladiel's sword to Theo, but we've got no clue. No narrative is bound to Theo and the sword, we could guess Galadriel's sword makes up the emotional loss of Theo, losing the ancient sword artifact. We can guess that. There is no story wrapped around any of this at all. No purpose, no sense of Galadriel's or Theo's characters getting anything from their interaction. It only accomplishes a sleight of hand that distracts the audience from the, uh, uh, the vast quantity of people that survived the lava blast. It gives us the unconnected husband exposition, the homage and the sword. And then Galadriel and Theo trot into the base camp. Why is Muriel blind? No clue. Why is Isildur missing? Well, that seems to be just so we can have Elendil hate Galadriel now. Of course, for some reason. The penultimate episode and we have more questions. It's the writers hoping something ends up sticking enough to draw us into season two. But we don't care anymore beyond passing interest. Meteor Man tries to save a tree burned by fallout from Mount Doom. A branch falls off the tree and he has to leave the Harfoots because? Because we need the mystics to burn the wagons later and we don't want them to come face to face with Meteor Man yet. But we definitely need the Harfoots to stay put. So we need something to burn their wagons. So once the evil priests have burned down some carts, a mini fellowship of Harfoots form and go off in search of Meteor Man. This should have happened at the end of episode 2. After 7 hours, we don't care. Elrond lobbies during the Elder to mind Mithril to help save the elves, but Durin the Elder is having none of that. As with the Harfoots, it feels like we are in the same place we were about five episodes ago. The net effect of these five episodes is to have Elrond possess one nugget of Mithril, and Durin the Younger now has a new table. What do we feel when Elder Durin removes Younger Durin's status as heir apparent, because Young Durin values Elrond's friendship? as if he was a brother, we don't care. We're emotionally distanced from what's going on. It feels like conflict injected into the story because the writers want to create a specific outcome, which seems to be for Elrond to be back in the elven town with Celebrimbor and the Nugget of Mithril. The same elven town he was in with Celebrimbor and the Nugget of Mithril two or three episodes ago. These Elrond and Durin scenes are some of the best written and staged in the entire show. But nothing is happening. Even these scenes are outstaying their welcome. We're now just toiling at the want of the writers, not invested in the characters and their desires or the weight of the world the story is staged in. Then we come across a couple of extras who look like they signed up for a completely different show. We get a brief moment of hope, but then we learn Bronwyn is A, alive, and B, not only free of any burns, but recovering well from the arrow that pierced her chest just a day ago. All down to the wholesome goodness of Arendir's seeds, no doubt. I'm sure I wasn't meant to burst out laughing when I saw this scene, but I did. It just seems utterly pointless. Then we get this, which reminds us of Elendril's torment and newfound dislike of Galadriel, presumably because, because, writers. And then we get all the Numenorians that chewed up two episodes 
being leveraged into the story mid-season, packing up and heading back to Numenor, proving that none of them should ever have been in the story in the first place. They added nothing to the season other than the wasted minutes of our lives we invested in their screen time. Maybe that's a little bit harsh. And then we discover Halbrand has a mysterious wound that after a cursory glance is declared healable only by elvish medicine and with the shouts of his entire kingdom of 20 Southlanders ringing in his ears, Halbrand leaves them behind to follow Galadriel to the nearest elvish town. The episode ends with the Southlands title morphing into Mordor which looks like it took an intern 20 minutes using PowerPoint. The actual real transition of this land has no payoff because there has been no dramatic impact to the characters caused by Mount Doom spilling its contents onto the land. What do we know about the next episode? The last in the season? I'd warn you to leave in case I spoilt anything, but who really cares at this point? Maybe you do. I'd appreciate a like on your way out if you're of a mind. We know for sure episode 8 will end with a lot of unanswered questions. It's the only hope Amazon, let alone the writers, have that anyone will be back for season 2. Will we see Sauron? I think so, but it might be disguised for most of the show. Maybe a 5 second transformation at the end. If Sauron ends up being Halbrand at this stage, then all hope is lost for the show. It will be so 2D, with no creative hope. We do know the writers like to completely hide any plot twists, so it is more likely Sauron has shapeshifted into Gilgalad or Celebrimbor. Likely the former, possibly the, the latter, edging my bets here. But don't hold out much hope. The show has already demonstrated Mithril somehow heals Sauron infected leaves, which kind of justifies Gilgalad's crazy belief in the need to mine vast quantities of Mithril. Given Galadriel's name drop of her husband in the last episode in a, in a scene we didn't give a crap about, I'd wildly guess he'll turn up in this episode. And he might even be Sauron, who knows. I just pulled that out of my <clears throat> At the end, I'm guessing it seems Galadriel will fight somebody in the water based on this image we have and her uh, voiceover declaring that she uh, didn't travel across all the seas to drown uh, in that in that water there. This will probably uh, be near the end of the show. Probably she'll survive, I'd say, I guess. Maybe Galadriel is Sauron. That would be funny. I'm guessing the Elrond and Galadriel narratives will come together because this approach for Galadriel looks like the same place this happens, which I'm guessing is some kind of explosion caused by Elrond and Celebrimbor creating a ring out of the Mithril Nugget. Or maybe... Elrond and Celebrimbor and Halbrand. And the show did start with Elrond and Galadriel, so at least that would be a closing loop if they close the season together. Maybe Elrond is Sauron. Because, because... I'm joking. He does look fair, though. Isn't that the line? Sauron's fair form? I'm definitely joking. Maybe. We also see Nori goes a bit weird. We see the priest women. No idea why, to what end. It looks to me like the star constellation Meteor Man is chasing is the same symbol we saw directing the Yorks to Mordor in this show. Or possibly, actually, I just watched The Hobbit and it looks very close to the symbol Gandalf wrote on the uh, outside of Bilbo's door about 4,000 years in the future. Is Meteor Man a baddie? I doubt it, you know, whatever. In Tolkien lore, the Blue Wizards did end up in Mordor and were never seen again, at least one version of Tolkien's lore. I believe that's the case. I'm no expert. All knowledge of Tolkien's world, other than what I've seen in the movies and read in the book, comes from uh, watching Nerd of the Rings. Meteor Man will likely save the Harfoot Day, if not all the Harfoots. Okay, that's me done. A frustrating penultimate episode to a season that had me feel like I was in Middle Earth at times, but the season really never took me on a journey. Let's see if it can put anything out of the bag in this final episode. The tea leaves say no. Hopefully you found this video informative or maybe even a little entertaining. Let me know if you have any thoughts or alternative ideas for where this is going or for where the future seasons are heading. I'm guessing a massive time jump for season two and uh, we'll see Theo as a grown man hoiking about the sword, Galadriel's sword. If you could, I'd appreciate a like. It's the only way YouTube will ever know I'm here. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. Bye bye.